and welcome to Washington Talk. I'm In Jiang Chao. The U.S. Treasury announced sanctions on Chinese companies that help North Korea's illicit activities. President Trump later announced that he ordered withdrawal of additional sanctions on North Korea. Today, we take a look at the Treasury's latest actions and U.S. stance on strengthening sanctions on North Korea. We currently have both the toughest sanctions in history as well as the most promising diplomatic campaign in history, too. Is to abandon all of its weapons of mass destruction. In the studio with me today, Mr. Joshua Stanton, lawyer in Washington, D.C. Mr. Stanton has helped the U.S. Congress draft numerous North Korea sanctions bills and laws. His blog, FreeKorea.us, focuses on North Korea sanctions and humanitarian and political conditions in Korea. Also joining me, Mr. Scott Snyder, director of U.S.-Korea policy program at the Council on Foreign Relations. His latest book, South Korea at the Crossroads, charts the evolution of South Korean foreign policy and strategic choices. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Um, the U.S. Treasury uh, imposed new sanctions on Chinese shipping companies that um, help North Korea evade sanctions. So is this the beginning of U.S.'s stepped-up pressure against North Korea? I really see the sanctions that were announced as indications of intent to try to enforce uh, some of the existing sanctions, um, especially following the U.N. Security Council Panel of Experts report, uh, which revealed a number of areas where enforcement has been lacking. And so I don't yet see an expansion of scope of sanctions uh, in that uh, Treasury announcement. Uh, but I do see a greater uh, desire to enforce existing sanctions under the UNSC resolutions. Mm -hmm. And the Treasury also updated advisory and added uh, 95 ships that are thought to be involved in illegal ship-to-ship -ship transfers with North Korea. And for the first time, South Korean ship has been added. So what are the legal implications of being added into this advisory? Well, the UN Security Council resolutions say that when a government, a member state, has reasonable cause to believe that a ship has been involved in sanctions violations, the state is required to seize, seize the ship. Uh, so that will be an early test of South Korea's willingness to really enforce the resolutions as written. South Korea has a Coast Guard. It has a well-funded, advanced government. And to see that South Korea is allowing North Korean smuggling to occur through its ports and in some cases using its ships is uh, going to further cause Congress and the administration uh, distrust of the South Korean government. Mm -hmm. So what are the legal implications when you're once added into this advisory from the Treasury? It means that insurance companies and fuel suppliers and ports have increased obligations to uh, monitor the activities of that ship when it comes to port. Some ports and, and insurance companies, flags of convenience, may disassociate themselves with that vessel. Uh, and those that do not themselves potentially face sanctions under a couple of different authorities of U.S. law. Mm -hmm. That would definitely affect their business. Um, so Special Representative Began met with the members of U.N. Security Council and discussed sanctions implementations and also later met with European diplomats. So how should we read this? Um, in parallel with the latest sanctions um, imposition from the Treasury, is this another sign? Well, I think that uh, Special Representative Began had already indicated earlier last week uh, that uh, he perceives that the ball is in North Korea's court. We're kind of waiting to see how North Korea responds on a lot of these issues. Uh, 
Uh, and so in the meantime, I think that what Special Representative Began is really doing is uh, building the international coalition and trying to um, uh, ensure that there is support for continued pressure on North Korea as a means by which to encourage North Korea to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. And back home in the United States, um, U.S. Congress, there's increased calls for stronger sanctions against North Korea after the breakup of the Hanoi summit. Why do you think is that? I think one reason is uh, that there's a conclusion that has been drawn from the Hanoi summit that sanctions are working because it's what North Korea wanted to uh, get relief from. Uh, but also I think there's a sense of urgency with regards to uh, the inconclusive nature of the summit and the realization that uh, the threat to the United States has not ab abated as a result of top-level diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Can I also add something to this? I, I, in my conversations with Congress, what I see is a great deal of impatience with the sanctions strategy being focused on shipping, but really not doing what Congress wants to do in terms of finance. Finance, according to the UN panel of experts, uh, is uh, not uh, an area of the sanctions that has been well enforced, and the U.S. is the steward of the world financial system and Secretary Mnuchin has been particularly derelict mm -hmm. in not really enforcing Treasury regulations and anti-money laundering rules against the Chinese and third country banks that continue to launder North Korea's money. Mm -hmm. uh, when Secretary Pompeo says that we have the strongest sanctions against North Korea, this is demonstrably not true. Mm -hmm. We had stronger sanctions against Iran now, Obama had stronger sanctions against Iran in 2015. Mm -hmm. And so until we start to see significant civil penalties or indictments against banks that, according to our Justice Department and the UN panel of experts, continue to launder money for North Korea, mm -hmm. it will not be maximum pressure. Mm -hmm. You're right. So many um, senators and congressmen has been urging the administration to go after large Chinese banks in uh, previous years. Now that the U.S. is in trade war with China, do you think the U.S. may really go after these banks like the Agriculture Bank of China and Chinese Construction Bank? It depends on what you mean by go after. So if you mean essentially to block a large Chinese bank from the financial system, I doubt that. And I don't think that that would be a productive move. But what I do expect is that just as the administration has been willing to indict companies like Huawei and ZTE for sanctions violations, that we will begin to see stricter enforcement, hopefully, against the Chinese banking sector or civil penalties, which are a way that you can really impose a significant cost on a bank without destroying the bank. And this is what we did with large European banks to get them to comply with Iran sanctions during the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no good reason not to do that, and there is a, a growing congressional pressure mm -hmm. to, to take steps like this. And we will be seeing more letters and potentially more legislation from Congress pushing this particular deficiency. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I just want to add, I don't know that this is necessarily the cause of the congressional uh, focus uh, in this area, but the panel of experts report from the UN really in some ways reads like a how-to guide for North Korean sanctions evasion. And in some senses, you know, that essentially indicates that there are a lot of ways in which North Korea is still being allowed to manipulate the international system uh, as a way of avoiding sanctions. And so I think that what, you know, maybe what Congress is re really going at is what are the measures that are necessary in order to try to block those loopholes uh, that uh, North Korea has now been documented to be using uh, as a means by which to pursue their illicit activities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the UN panel of experts warned Seoul of transferring oil and fuel to Kaesong, and Seoul says that this is not a violation. But what is the verdict from the panel of experts? Well, the panel was very clear that to the DPRK, exact quote from the resolutions means exactly what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. To the DPRK, Kaesong is inside North Korea. South Korea has taken the position that it's some kind of a neutral ground, that it's not exactly North Korea, and this is completely at odds with the plain meaning of the, of the resolution. Mm -hmm. Let's remember, South Korea is represented on the UN panel of experts. 
when these resolutions, including 2270 and 2321 passed, the South Korean representative uh, at the UN Security uh, or at the United Nations spoke in favor of the resolutions. They can't now turn around and simply violate them and offer some spurious excuse for doing so. Mm -hmm. So what are U.S. concerns if South Korea is found to be violating these sanctions? Well, I think the U.S. concern is, one, we need to have a unified position with regards to uh, how we define what is permissible in terms of interaction with uh, North Korea. Uh, and so any time that there are issues that come up where South Korea has a different interpretation from the United States on what the sanctions uh, legislation actually means, uh, and what is permissible, that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. And I think that the U.S.-Korea coordination mechanism that has been established uh, has proven thus far to be a pretty effective way of addressing those issues uh, following some problems that arose last summer, mm -hmm. uh, especially related to the Kaesung Liaison Office mm -hmm. uh, and also the Pyongyang Summit. Mm -hmm. And so now I think that we're on a better track. Uh, and I, my own feeling, based on conversations that I have had in South Korea last week, is that at the institutional bureaucratic level, uh, both sides are very much on the same page. Uh, but there's still this political desire, I think, by the top levels on the progressive side in the Moon administration to revive Kumgang and Kaesong because they had done it before. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, those issues are at odds with each other and are generating some tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that political desire of reviving Kim Gang and Kaesong, Senators um, Cruz and Menendez warned that South Korean banks and businesses may be exposed to U.S. sanctions. So these uh, projects at Kaesong and Kim Gang, do they meet the secondary sanctions criteria? Uh, it depends on whether the U.S. has jurisdiction. The U.S. gets jurisdiction in two ways, typically. One is a U.S. person is involved. Second, most likely, uh, there are dollar transactions. So the transaction occurs in part in the United States. You ask, how can it be that a transaction that is conducted between two Koreas is in the United States? Because these are dollar-denominated transactions that require on two correspondent banks in the United States, typically New York, to clear those transactions. That gives the Treasury Department jurisdiction. And historically, URI Bank, which has handled these transactions, uh, has operated in dollars because dollars are what Pyongyang wants. So this exposes URI Bank potentially to legal risks. Now, recently, there was a report showing that Uri Bank has an ATM inside Kaesong. And if Uri Bank was relying on this interpretation by the Moon administration that Kaesong isn't really North Korea, mm -hmm. by placing that ATM there, it has potentially violated the UN Security Council resolutions and U.S. government mm -hmm. uh, national sanctions mm -hmm. against the North Korean financial sector. Mm -hmm. So the banks that get involved in investments in North Korea potentially expose themselves to any number of legal risks. Mm -hmm. I would have to raise the veracity issue with that reporting because mm -hmm. from uh, what I know and what has been reported is that Uri Bank withdrew from Kaesong in the February of 2016 mm -hmm. and they just operate temporary office in Seoul and not inside North Korea. Um, I want to ask you, um, so the Moon administration, after the Hanoi summit, says that they will prepare for the resumption of Kumgang and Kaesong within the boundaries of the sanctions regime. So what is possible within the sanctions regime? Well, Josh may be better to answer that question, but uh, one thing is clear, and that is that uh, no cash can go to North Korea. And so that means that any uh, activities or preparations uh, would have to involve you know, primarily in-kind arrangements, uh, interestingly, a few uh, months ago in preparation for the Hanoi summit, Special Representative Began, you know, mentioned, I think, an escrow account. I can imagine that that might be one means by which some interchange could occur. Uh, but really, I think that uh, the UN Security Council resolutions constitute a substantial block to the possibility of reviving uh, these projects in the way that we had thought of them previously mm -hmm. as they operated uh, during the Nomu Hyun administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me just be a little more specific here. Mm -hmm. UN Security Council Resolution 
2321 prohibits joint ventures and cooperative, and, uh, cooperative entities with North Korea unless there is uh, approval from what's called the 1718 Committee uh, under the direction of the Security Council. That committee operates by consensus, which means that any member of the 1718 Committee can effectively veto permission to open a joint venture or a cooperative entity. I expect that the United States and perhaps other governments will continue to oppose reopening Kaesong or Kumgang or any such joint venture until North Korea performs meaningly on its disarmament obligations. We've seen nothing like that yet. On mm -hmm. a closing note, um, Mr. Snyder, so what is the current U.S. stance and position on North Korea, do you think? I think the ball is in North Korea's court. Uh, we're continuing to try to impose pressure uh, in the form of sanctions. Uh, and as Secretary Pompeo mentioned, we're still ready to pursue vigorous diplomatic action, uh, essentially to get Kim Jong-un to make a clear decision on complete denuclearization and a roadmap uh, in that direction. Mm -hmm. We'll end our conversation here and watch video for our next discussion. Kim Jong-un. But Chairman Kim and I have a very good relationship. Jong Un and myself, Chairman Kim. I think it's a very good one. I think it remains good. Both President Trump and Chairman Kim stresses they have great personal relationship. A North Korean official says their chemistry is mysteriously wonderful. So, Mr. Stanton, how did the personal relationship between the two leaders make any progress in denuclearization? I, I see no evidence that it made any progress at all. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think it's helpful? Well, I do think that we've now established some dialogue channels between the U.S. and North Korea that were absent uh, at the height of confrontation, the war of words, fire and fury. Mm -hmm. I think we'll want to retain some ability to communicate uh, between uh, leaders. Uh, but we, what we really need to see is evidence of uh, joint agreement and cooperation uh, between the institutional bureaucracies of the two countries. Uh, and that, I think, is really what they were trying to achieve uh, in Hanoi and failed to achieve. Uh, the Hanoi summit exposed the gaps, and it remains to be seen whether the gaps can be closed. Mm -hmm. uh, President Trump, in general, in foreign policy, tends to um, emphasize personal relationships. So what do you think are the strengths and pitfalls of this approach? Well, I think President Trump likes to emphasize personal relationships because it places him at the center of the diplomacy. Uh, but the problem with that is really that uh, diplomacy involves national interest, uh, it really involves uh, uh, cooperation between governments, uh, and so the personal relationship by itself cannot translate uh, into influence on the uh, uh, governmental relationships unless uh, the president is working in concert effectively with the institutional bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Stanton, another person interested in personal relationships seems to be President Moon Jae-in of South Korea. After the uh, breakdown of Hanoi summit, uh, the Blue House emphasizes that Seoul will play a facilitating role to um, reignite talks between U.S. and North Korea. But don't you think the breakdown in itself um, raised us doubts about South Korea's facilitating role? It, it does. I mean, it really exposes that South Korea's actual influence over North Korea's national security policies is fairly minimal. I think that North Korea was looking to put a wedge between the U.S. and South Korea and had considerable success in doing so. Moon Jae-in, really, with the, the suspension of uh, the liaison office or North Korea's participation in it, uh, has really shown, uh, it's put Moon in the position of really not pleasing North Korea while at the same time losing a lot of the trust of the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, I would simply say that um, 
Uh, President Moon and South Korea, they've got a big stake in trying to help close the gap. Uh, but at the same time, there's a risk in mediation. You don't want to be placed in the middle. Uh, you don't want to be the messenger. The messenger in American uh, idiomatic language is the one who gets shot. Mm -hmm. And so there's, dangerous, mm -hmm. there's danger in playing that role. Mm -hmm. uh, but if South Korea can find a way to facilitate between the two sides and help clarify gaps, then I think that can be a useful role for South Korea. Mm -hmm. Just add one point to that. I, look, no one says that there should not be channels of communication and dialogue between North Korea and the U.S. or North Korea and South Korea. It's just that Americans will be confused by the idea that their soldiers are protecting a government that sees itself as somewhere between the U.S. and North Korea in terms of its interests. Mm -hmm. And there's been, Mr. Stanton, a series of asymmetries since last year. But don't you think it's all pomp and circumstance? Was it any helpful in resolving this fundamental issue of denuclearization? I see no evidence that it has advanced us closer to that goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think we have to be very mindful of just how important that goal is. I see a lot of people now suggesting that we have to accept and can accept North Korea as a nuclear power those people need to answer to why we can live with a government that proliferated a nuclear reactor or, or built a nuclear reactor in the Syrian desert in a place that came under the control of ISIS for two years, mm -hmm. that used a persistent chemical agent in a crowded airport terminal in Kuala Lumpur that cyber attacks the United States, that has helped Assad use chemical weapons against children in Syria. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't believe that this is a country that we can coexist with as a responsible nuclear state. That is a very dangerous formula. And Mr. Snyder, um, the confidence building measures like, you know, re, um, establishing a liaison office or pursuing inter-Korean projects, mm -hmm. is this any helpful in denuclearization? Well, it remains to be seen whether that can lead to progress in denuclearization, but I think that the critical issue that the Trump administration has been focusing on uh, in its dialogue with Kim Jong-un is whether or not we can achieve a complete denuclearization versus the North Korean offer of an incomplete denuclearization. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the North Korean defector Tae Young ho described what North Korea was doing as selling its used car mm -hmm. while maybe keeping its Maybach. Uh, and that's not really what the U.S. is interested in. So I agree with Josh on that point. Uh, but I also see in our policy debate uh, another point of view that half a loaf is better than none. Uh, and there's a risk, uh, I think, in this of you know, trying to go for everything and as a result losing the opportunity to curb uh, in some form uh, North Korea's program. But at the same time, you don't want to risk uh, again following the path to incomplete denuclearization. Mm -hmm. Now time for the photo moment. Time to look at an interesting North Korea picture. Today we have a picture of the Director of National Intelligence, Dan Coats, meeting with South Korean President Moon Jae-in in Seoul this week. South Korea's presidential office says the two sides held wide and in-depth discussions on issues concerning South Korea and the U.S. What has brought the top U.S. spy chief all the way to Seoul? Scott? Well, I think that uh, on the South Korean side, the intelligence channel is the bedrock uh, in terms of the interaction with North Korea. Uh, and we have seen in the Trump administration uh, that the intelligence channel actually has taken the lead on some of this. Mm -hmm. And so having uh, coordination and full understanding between the U.S. and South Korea on what exactly is happening in North Korea is critical as a basis for pursuing an effective policy. Mm -hmm. Josh? Whatever they're saying, they're not telling me, but I mm -hmm. hope that they're asking uh, about why North Korean coal smuggling ships are showing up in South mm -hmm. Korean ports again and again. Mm -hmm. Historically, where there is a North-South summit, mm -hmm. there is eventually a North-South summit scandal. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this one is hiding in plain sight in the form of North Korean coal smuggling to the South. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Mr. Snyder, Mr. Stanton, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And this was Washington Talk from the Voice of America, and I'm Eun Jung Cho. Join us next week for more analysis on North Korea.